Yep. Yeah. Yep. No, all good. Um, all right. We'll get started. So, um, hey, everybody. My name is Randy K, and I am the host of the Caught Up podcast. Today, uh, we have Derek Allister. Derek is the co founder of On Deck Softball, um, along with his amazing wife, Joanne. Derek uh, is a husband, a father of three, I think. Um, unless yeah. there, you have any others I don't know about. Nope. Um, also a grandpa to little Aspen Allister and Derek, welcome. I appreciate you jumping on. How's everything? Good, good. You know, little Aspen class of 2041. Yep. I think, yep. I think she's going to be a shortstop, maybe a center field. <laughs> well, we're going to have to work that out. Flute. Say that again. She may play the flute, you know, so <laughs> right. whatever works. You never know. I'm uh I'm also in that 2041 2042 class. You know it. And I know it. you know as you know, so I'm I'm kind of hoping for a short stop as well. So we'll see what happens. Maybe we'll yeah. just uh make them split time. How about that? Yes. As you well <laughs> know, Randy, it's all about them being healthy and happy, right? Oh my gosh, it's been That's uh sweet. I've never really been um I never really paid too much attention, even when my own wife was pregnant. But when once my daughter got pregnant, I was on basically on every update. I was, you know, just kind of following along. How's she feeling? You know, how did you know? What was funny was the they waited three months to tell us, and I never even knew why. My wife was like, "Yeah, they don't. You don't really say anything until until you get through that first uh, first, you know, I think it's first trimester, right?" And so yeah, it was kind of interesting. How's your family? How's everything going? Doing well, you know. Um, Heather's doing great out out in Georgia. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the people in the travel ball world know Heather. Right. Now, um, you know, KJ's doing great with ODM, and Jess is off to a good start. You know, they're playing probably the hardest schedule in the country, and um, they knocked off number two Texas last weekend, and you know. When you when you have a great pitcher, you you always have a chance. Oh man, it's uh it, that that's uh, that's the truth. Um, she was really good last year, and and props to her and to Jessica for being able to keep that that thing going. Because as yeah. you know, I mean, it seems like just because you're there last year doesn't mean you're still there the following season. So, well, so good on everybody, yeah. right? You you got to get a little lucky. You have to get the right draw. You know, there's only one team, really, that can say we're going to Oklahoma City, and that's Oklahoma right now. <laughs> um, right. You know, everybody else, you got to get a little luck. You got to get the right draw. It's funny. You know? I was talking to uh, Alina Torres' dad the other day, and um, he said, I said, you know, I would tell you you're saving money, but, um, you know, not paying travel ball dues. I said, but I, I can't imagine – well, I can't imagine because I did it, but, you know, trying to, to look at purchasing airfare, you know, three or four days before you have to leave. And he says, well, you know, I'm kind of lucky right now. We just kind of book it because we're pretty sure we're going to be there. Yeah. So I said, yeah. oh, that's true. I, um, I tell you what, that Texas scene, though, is good. Mike oh, White I has here rolling. I know. Texas. I know. They are really good. Really yeah, good. Yeah, they look like they're... Um, they look like they're really just handling everybody. And so that's why, uh, you know, that, that win for, for Stanford was huge. Yeah. That was big. What, um, so I don't know if a lot of people know this, but you spend a lot of time, obviously you live the summers in Tahoe and you're actually in Arizona right now. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Love it down here. You know, I was born here, born, born oh, in oh. Tucson. Um, my okay. dad was a teacher in Tombstone. And um, so I spent the first five years of my life, you know, in Tombstone, Arizona. And then oh. we moved out to California. But we had relatives in Arizona. My mom and dad went to the U of A. Um, deep roots here. Love the state of Arizona. Um, love the weather. Love the golf courses. Love the people. Arizona is just a good place. And it's a good time to be here right now. So what do you do with your time? Sounds like you sound like you do some golf. 
Yeah, this playing a little golf. Um, there's an amazing amount of work that still goes into on deck softball in the spring. Oh my gosh. You know, that never stops. I'm on my computer every day. Um, so, you know, have, have a little fun, go on some walks because we can instead of being buried in snow at Lake Tahoe. <laughs> Um, yeah. you know, and just have some fun and travel around. So speaking of traveling, so what, uh, what's your, what's your journey as far as, um, being into softball and, and doing, you know, what you do, what is, what has brought you to this point and what got you interested in softball? That That's a great question. Um, you know, my girls played it, uh, loved it as kids. And um, I was a college basketball coach. And to be honest, those 10 and under games who were not for me. Um, <laughs> you know, we were living in Reno and then Texas, you know, at the time when they were going through all that. Um, but then as they started to get good, and we realized they had a chance to play in college. You know, it, it just kept getting better. And, and then finally, um, Joanne was actually coaching Division One softball at Stephen F. Austin. Um, and as I got to know coaches, being the basketball coach, where we had a very sophisticated recruiting process, um, I used to get on the softball coaches and say, you know, when, when are you guys going to get sophisticated in this world of recruiting? And I'd ask Joanne, she'd say, I'm going down to Houston for a, you know, a tournament. And I'd say, what are you going to do? Well, I'll go to games and watch. I said, well, do you have lists or something? Because we have those things in basketball, you yeah. know, and um, no, we don't have those things. And so when I got out of the game in 2000, I'd always told people that it would be fun to take the basketball principles, apply them to softball, and have some fun. And we did that, and we um, started out with five coaches. Connie Clark at Texas was our first coach. Um, Connie Clark, um, John Rittman, Lou Harris, Teresa Wilson, and... There was one more, Jay Miller, who was oh. Heather's coach at Missouri. They were our first five coaches. And we would go out on the weekends and watch games and send them notes on players. And they paid some small, small fee. I, I want to say like $75 a year. Okay. <laughs> wow. um, and we were just having fun. And then all of a sudden it became – their friends who were joining up with us. And then it was friends of friends. And then it was friends of friends of friends. And now we have like about 250, you know, real core followers of ours on the D1 level, you know, who we've been working with for years. And um, we're having a great time. So it just evolved because I don't know if a lot of people know you were a basketball coach. Is that right? Yes. Yep. I was so at Washington State, um, then Cal. When the great Phoenix guard, um, Phoenix Suns guard Kevin Johnson played at Cal. Really? I was there for KJ's years, yeah. And we actually named our, named our son after him. He was a great guy close to my wife. Um and then went from Cal to Nevada and then got to be a head coach at Stephen F. Austin out in Texas. Um, didn't like being a head coach at all. I, w I wouldn't be a head coach at all, Randy. I, Duke, Duke could offer me $10 million and I'd say no. You know, um, being a head coach just was, it just wasn't my cup of tea. I wanted to coach. I wanted to recruit. I wanted to have fun. Um, you know, and being the head coach where you have to answer to administrators, mm -hmm. boosters, you know, do all that stuff. Just, I, I didn't like it at all. 
so then I got out of the game, and and here we are. So you get out of the game, um, and you said you took you wanted to take that model mm -hmm. to softball, and so here we are, you know, 22, 23 years later, 24 years later almost, yeah. um, with on-deck softball. Um, for those who may not know what on-deck softball is, um, what is it? In, in How can you describe it to somebody who may not know? At, at its most basic level, we scout for the college coaches. So um, there was just a tournament out here recently, a couple of weeks ago, and we went out and watched games. And, um, you know, we saw some players that we knew and we're, we're keeping track of, and we saw some players that we didn't know. And um, we put together a report and send that to the college coaches. That goes all over the country. And, um, you know, so at its most basic level, we scout for the college coaches. Right. They pay us, we send them information. Okay, so you guys scout for colleges uh, at its basic level. What is the Alistair Report, and uh, or better known as probably the Alistair Index? Right. What is uh, how does that tie into to uh, to your recruiting uh, for the coaches? Yeah, um, those are actually two separate things. The, um, okay. the Alistair Report, uh, on deck report, is what we put out after an event. And then periodically, like after this tournament, I put out a report on the kids I saw. Um, when we have our big event at Rosetta Canyon in June, as soon as that event gets done, I'm on the computer for a couple of days, um, writing about the event, talking about every player who's in our event. Um, every single player gets talked about um, in our report. I write a paragraph on each one of them talking about strengths and weaknesses etc um so we put out a large number of reports over the course of the year and um those those just go across the country and the colleges use them to find players that they need to recruit check in on players that they're recruiting but they want to know how they're doing mm -hmm. uh, you know, invite kids to their camps. That's a big part of our report now. Um, gotcha. Th there's a lot of kids out there who, um, you know, get invited to camps and they're not sure why. And it's because they appeared in our, one of our reports, to be honest. But funny, funny story. There's an SEC coach, and I'm not going to name him because we all know him. <clears throat> but he used to send letters to recruits well, emails, and um, say, hey, I saw you at the Colorado Jamboree on Monday, and, you know, you had a great day. We'd like to invite you to our camp. That dude was never at our event. You know, he, <laughs> he just saw in our report that I said, hey, this kid could really play or whatever, you know, and then it was like, um, you know, hey, I saw you. But but that's cool. All we care about yeah. is getting that kid at the you know, the exposure and the invitation to the camp. That's all, all we really care about. Yeah. So, so you out there watching, I mean, it goes back to, you know, somebody's always watching, right? So you out there watching um, a player may then um, get invited to one of your events or try out for one of your, you know, for your, one of your jamborees, uh, get to a, a, a little bit bigger event, a little more select event, Mm -hmm. And then boom, you're kind of on the radar. That's that's kind of how I remember um, meeting you and meeting uh, meeting Joanne and learning about on deck was you know back when you know I remember I think it was Mount Sac um, your yeah. event in Mount Sac. Danny Danny Nelson and Bree Maha were invited to go out there and oh my gosh, from that point on it was like a whirlwind of college coaches i remember i was i was at rose mofford sports complex here in phoenix and ralph weekly walks up to me and he says coach my name is ralph weekly and um what can you tell me about danny nelson basically you know um 
just kind of asking about the type of player that she was. And it, it was really interesting. I had no idea um, that that it was that big or that would have that much of an impact. Yeah. Uh, I, I tell you, those Mount Sac camps back in the day. Now, the recruiting model was a little different back then. But, sure. um, you know, they were amazing. I mean, we'd have 100 coaches sitting on one field, 120 coaches sitting on one field, just sitting there for two days watching the kids play. And speaking of Danny Nelson, one of my all-time favorite players, yeah. that girl was yeah. good, man. Oh she gosh. could play the game at shortstop. Um, love that kid. I've talked to her a couple times since. And, um, yeah. you know, she seems to be doing well. But, man, that girl could play the game. And Bree Maha was just we, – we had a great time following her career at ASU. But yeah. we loved those girls. You know, I mean, they, they were just super, super, super young ladies. You guys have had some good ones. Um, you know, Bree is actually the – I think she's like the head trainer at Red Mountain High School. She trains all the football team. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. She is. She's the strength and conditioning coach, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, um, I, tell, also... I tell you what, we've, you know, we have tryouts to get into our events. Mm -hmm. And um, Maddie Barrano mm -hmm. came through our tryout. She was just a skinny little thing. Came to South Mountain. Mindy, your mom, still to this day says, I don't know why you chose her, Derek. And because she could barely get the ball to the grass. You know, she was such a small little girl. And I said, because she had great mechanics, you know, it was, mm -hmm. she is going to grow up. Um, but she had, she had the skill set. Um, Grace Lyons um, was at that same tryout at Scottsdale Community College. Um, Alyssa Goler, not Alyssa Goler, Alyssa DiCarlo came to another oh. um, tryout, you know, and th now that's a funny story. Alyssa came and she was playing on a smaller team playing right field and she's fielding ground balls. And I'm like, who is this kid? She looks really good. And, um, some of her teammates were there. And so I took Alyssa aside and said, you know, Hey, what position do you like? You know? And, um, she goes, well, I play outfield. And I go, Oh, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, center fielder. I go, okay, center field. And she goes, well, I play right field. Okay, so now doubt starts creeping in. And I'm thinking maybe she can't hit a lick, right? Then she gets up to bat and it's like whack, whack, whack. And I'm going, what the heck? So after the camp, I grabbed her and her mom. And I said, listen, we have this event, Mount Sac, coming up in like three weeks. And I want you to come to this. And her mom was a little, I don't know. You know, they weren't sure about the whole thing. And Keith Householder was standing there <clears throat> and Keith took them aside and said, listen, you know, if he offers you the spot, you need to go. Yeah. So they said, okay, we'll be there. We sent them their invitation and everything. On the day of the camp, a listener mom were walking up towards the field. I went down to see him. There were already some coaches down there. And um, I grabbed a list and I said, Alyssa, you're going to play shortstop today. She goes, oh, I don't know, Mr. Allister. You know, I, I, I feel better in the outfield. And I go, no, you're going to play shortstop. And she said, I, I don't want to. And I go, then fine, I'll refund you your money, turn around, go home. I go, I'm not going to have you in the camp unless you play shortstop. Her mom probably didn't like me at that moment in time. <laughs> but, um, but that's okay. Alyssa, Alyssa said, sure, okay, I'll do it. Within 30 minutes of that camp starting, I had SEC Pac-12 coaches coming up saying, who the heck is that kid? I said, where'd you find her? I said, I'll just tell you later. And um, when the dust had settled after the camp, she had visits set up all over the country. She went on a full ride to Georgia, became an All-American shortstop. Um, and to this day, when we have a tryout, Joanne will text me and say, go find the next Alyssa DiCarlo. And um, she is just part of the on-deck legend. There's no doubt about it. Love that kid. Followed her, stay in touch with her a little bit. Um, and that kid, man, uh, we just love that story. 
That is a great story. You know, my AD, uh, Alyssa DiCarlo, she um, went to high school with my daughter, Taylor. Mm -hmm. So they were the same grade, same high school. What a great high school run. Um, I remember when she was in, uh, when she was with us uh, with Jim Henry, um, Jim told me, he says, wait till Derek sees AD swing the bat. His exact words to me. And yeah. uh I yeah, I just I just talked to to Alyssa um and her dad recently. Um not sure if you heard, but her mom passed. Um oh, yeah, so her mom heard. Rita. Yeah, and so uh I was you know, I was able to connect with them a little bit and uh but she's doing great, Van's doing great. Uh Van was a pretty big part in uh in helping us on the back end of starting Firecrackers Arizona. So Mm -hmm. um love that family yeah um yeah no that's a great story that's a great story so yeah. so when you talk about um your your camps like you just described how many of those did you do um was that something that you just came right out and did a whole bunch like right away or did you do a couple and then how many did you do in that first year and how many do you do you know now in the present we, time you know we grow slowly i'm just more comfortable you know, growing step by step as opposed to just dump, dumping something on the softball world. Um, so in 2005, it might have been a 2004 Nationals, <clears throat> I was with Sue Enquist, the great UCLA coach. Yep. And again, I started in on her about, why don't you get the better players together and bring them together and, you know, have somebody – work them out, kind of things based on basketball, um, like the Nike camp and the ABCD camp and that stuff. And she said, well, we've had people try. Nobody can ever do it. And I said, okay, whatever. You know, you guys are unsophisticated. You know, I just <laughs> her. And um, she said, well, why don't you do it? I said, no, 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 no. Too much work. And um, – Sue's a good friend, very persuasive lady. By the time she got done with me, it was like, okay, Sue, we'll try. So what we did, no lie, no lie, this is the gospel truth. We decided to run a camp up in Seattle. And the reason we went to Seattle was, number one, we had this great guy named Eric Bolstad who ran the absolute blast back in the day, okay? And he said he'd help. <clears throat> and two... We said, let's go to Seattle because if we fall on our face and it doesn't work, nobody will know. <laughs> right. Because nobody cares, right? If we went to Southern California or Arizona or wherever, Texas, and we bombed, everybody would know. So we went to Seattle. We had 44 players. I think 14 coaches showed up including Mississippi State, Jay Miller flew in and um, had a great time. It, it was a great event. And when Joanne and I got in the car at the end, it was like, okay, we're on to something. Yeah. And the next year, we had our first big camp in Las Vegas, another 44 players, um, standalone event. There was no tournament. Dorian Shaw. Um, we had East Coast kids, um, West Coast kids. They all came in and just trusted that we were going to put something together good. We didn't know if it would still work because it was a standalone event. Um, I had Dallas Escobedo jogging the warning track, getting warmed up. Um, Caitlin Boyd getting warmed up. Kenzie Fowler, some of the Arizona kids that were wow. there. And there's not a coach in sight, and we're 20 minutes away from the beginning of the camp. And I'm just going, oh, man, talk about nervous, right? Oh, I bet. Um, I bet. And then in walks Sue Enquist at about the 12-minute mark. And I took a breath of fresh air, and I thought, if nobody else comes, Sue Enquist is here to sit and watch these kids, and that's worth it. And when it all was said and done, 
We have 33 coaches, um, big time coaches sitting there. The camp went great. Um, we ended up having 28 all Americans come out of that camp. Wow. Um, so that, that was our first camp. Then slowly we grew from there. And now we have about 12 camps a year. Yeah. Cause you're, you're, um, you know, I've, I've worked with you a little bit. I've seen you work. Um, you're really hands-on and, and you like to make sure that there's not an athlete that goes through your event that you don't get eyes on. Is that true? Is 100%. That a... Um, yeah. it's just one of our core principles, Randy. Um, yeah. you know, we, we want these young players to experience what our daughters experienced and what we experienced as a family. Um, that's very, very important to me, you know, and I tell parents, your daughter gets that college uniform, puts it on the first time you want to be there. You know, um, she yeah. teases it up the first time you want to be there. Um, it's just such a great journey for a family. Um, great journey for a, you know, mom, dad, and their daughter. Um, and it takes siblings all over the country, you know, so that isn't bad either. So yeah, um, it, it's just a great, great experience, I think, for all. And, and we want to be part of that. Um, but most importantly, we want the kids to be successful and feel good about what they're doing. So when you talk about that experience, I mean, that's obviously, you know, being in that moment, being in those events, being in front of coaches, um, you know, a coach can see an athlete and, you know, say, hey, I think that kid's, you know, she kind of stands out. Um, but then where does it go from there when it, when it comes to on deck? Uh, you know, the information, the, uh, the write-ups that you said that you do for every player – how does that get to the coaches? Do they have access to that? Yeah, we, um, the report again, the Alistair the report, report yep. goes out. Um, we, we don't talk to individual coaches really because one of our things is we work for them all. So it's very important that they all feel they're getting the same information. You know, if somebody felt like Jess, and I think this is a tribute to what we do. If somebody felt like Jess was getting advantages over them in the process, we'd be finished. I mean, we'd have no credibility. Um, I think the fact that here our daughter is a major college coach, is now contending for a national title, and yet coaches all over the country still work with us, I think that is a good testament to our objectivity and the fact that everybody gets the same stuff, you know, so we don't sit down with a coach and say, Hey, you need to recruit so-and-so or so-and-so everybody right. gets the same information. Then it's up to them. You know, I mean, they got to do some work, you know? So, um, so that's kind of how we frame this whole thing. Yeah, I've run into Jess a few times, and, and years ago I had mentioned, you know, kind of jokingly, but like, well, you know, you could ask your dad about this kid, and it, there wasn't even, she gave that zero time of day. Like, there was nothing, like, and I realized, I was like, that wasn't what I should have said or how I, <laughs> even joking, like, right. wasn't even having it. Right. So, no. so, So I agree, you can tell that it's, it's, you know, Stanford and on deck and whatever relationship that you guys have seems to be outside of those two parameters. Yeah, we don't really talk softball. She you mentioned may, that to me once. She may, may talk coaching with me, you know, mm -hmm. simply because of my background and her, you know, present profession. So um, we may talk coaching, but we don't really talk softball per se because she doesn't want to. And to be honest, the quickest way to get off Stanford's list is to say, hey, you know, your dad said this to her. You know, I, I mean, she might just cross you off. 
Um, <laughs> I say that tongue in cheek, but yeah, well, for sure. But yeah, no, she she draws a clear separation. But but let yeah. me tell you a little bit about that girl. Um, when when she was eleven years old and we moved to Texas, um, she was in a game and I was, you know, at the game and she was a catcher and so I was right there at home plate. And there was a crazy play at the plate and the umpire called the runner safe. And I, I pulled the dad move and yelled a little too much. And, um, you know, but it wasn't horrible. We got in the car after the game and here's my 11 year old, all dirty, you know, and everything. We drove out of the parking lot and she goes, dad. And I go, yeah. And she goes, I never want you to do that again. And I go, do what? Yell at the umpire like you did. And I said, okay. From then on, I watched games down the line, like in right field, where the pressure wasn't quite so much, you know. But here's my little 11-year-old setting me straight, you know, because I had gotten out of line a little, gotten a little squirrely. Um, and she just said, I'm, I'm not going to have that. So, you know, that's just Jess. She's... Um, she's a different breed of cat. For sure. Um, you know, parents always get a little bit animated and worked up. I mean, I think it'd be, the game might be a little better if a few more kids, a few more 11 year olds pulled their parents aside, <laughs> mine included. Right. Mine included. Um, so I want to ask you a little bit about the analytic side of, mm -hmm. of what you do. Um, the, the metrics testing um what when it comes to metrics for, first of all can you just give us a brief overview for those that may not know what what does the on deck odm metrics odm measurements what does that tell you as a as someone who evaluates and what does that tell the coaches yeah um just real quick, we in 2009, we started the ODM metrics. Um, we used a football group. We hired a football group to come out and do it for us um, for a while. We, we had gotten with some of our coaches, and they had said, can you get us real numbers? Because there were so many numbers out there that were simply not real numbers. Um, and we said, yeah, we'll do that. So at Mount SAC, actually, we brought this group together, you know, out to measure our kids in these events. And, um, and, and we got those numbers. Um, then we started adding it to every event. Um, you know, then we got the algorithm and the Alistair index, which is without question, Randy, the single most predictive number in the sport. There's no doubt about it. People can question it or whatever, and I, I'll sit down and tell them exactly why. But we can tell you from a data standpoint, and, and that's about it, just data, we can predict who's going to play at what level. Okay. Um, now, is that infallible? No, because life isn't infallible. But, um, but it's the most predictive number without a question. Nobody can question that. So, um, you know, we just started testing these athletes. We've tested tens of thousands of athletes, 80,000, I, I, don't, I don't know, over the years. And now we've noticed trends. And so we have a, um, a pretty good feel for what a high level, a mid-level, a low-level Division One player looks like. Um, statistically. Now, that's not to say that there aren't great players at other levels. We tested a college player up in Minnesota who was a high-level athlete, but a D3 player, because she didn't have the skill set to match her athleticism. You know, mm -hmm. and we've... There's a girl that played in Missouri is starting, starting shortstop for years. Um who had a lower index, but she was so highly skilled. You know, she she made up for it with her skill set. 
So um, she wasn't quite as athletic as you want, but tremendous skills, you know. Um, so she played at Missouri. So so there are outliers out there. But the bottom line is Grace Lyons was a great athlete. We know that from her index. And she had great skills. And we know that from watching her. And so she became a great player. Alyssa DiCarlo, same thing. Great athlete, great skills, became a great player. You know, so right on down the line, um, there's a blending between the data and the skill set that has to occur. Data isn't everything. It's just part of a greater picture. But, um, but it's part of it, you know. But you still have to be able to hit the ball, pick it up, and throw it. Yeah. You know, so. And do all of that with some pressure. Absolutely. You know. Yes. Yeah. Um, we tell – so I tell my kids in, in my organization and in, in all my teams, um, let's, let's get to a, an on-deck testing, uh, an ODM testing, and then let's see where you're at and let's figure out – where you stand out and where you need to improve. And then let's go work those things. And then, you know, go back and test six, eight months, however long. Um, we try to get to a couple a year. Is that is that the norm? Is that what you see as being the recipe yeah. to improvement? Yeah. Now my son, KJ, you know, he was like my workout guy. He took over ODM back in 2015, I think, 2014. Um, and now does a great job when he goes all over the country, you know, testing players. Um, so, you know, he could answer a lot more questions about it. But generally, right. a couple times a year is a good measure. It doesn't define a kid. It identifies strengths and weaknesses, just like you're saying. Um, you know, it gives you things to work on. Gives you things to check off, and uh, and you, and you go from there. But um, but again, it's only part of a bigger picture. Um, it's a snapshot of a kid. Um, is it important? Vitally important, because the game's getting so athletic. Does it define a player? No, it doesn't define a player at all. Yeah, we're fortunate to have KJ locally. Um, you know, to be able to, to get out and have him uh, work our kids and, and test our kids. So we, um, we would strongly suggest every player out there get their ODM numbers. And, you, you know, there are other numbers out there. But, but yep. one of the key things for data is you have to be worried about dirty data and dirty in the sense that it's not quite right. You know, um, we have the best rap soto guy in America who helps us out. And, and he talks about dirty dad all the time. He's a former MLB guy. Well, not former, he still works with MLB, but yeah. um, he's an MLB guy. He talks about dirty data and you have to be immersed in it all. Like KJ and his wife are to recognize it. Um, yes. There, there are some people out there who fudge a little, we know a video guy who's a great guy. He's helped tons of kids, but he fudges his data and <laughs> he admits it. And and I tell him, what are you doing? You know, yeah. the, the kid's not a two, eight, five down the line. She's a three, one. Well, you yeah. know, we're giving her that extra step. And it's like, no, you can't do that. You know, yeah. but that's why the college coaches keep coming back to us, you know, um, because they know, the data they're getting is rock solid. Um, if KJ has a question, he goes back and tests. And uh, there was one situation where um, there was some data that um, somebody who was working with us pulled, and KJ wasn't sure about it. It didn't quite make sense. So he flew back to Northern California and tested about five girls um, just to make sure. And um, and I think that's an important thing, you know. All numbers aren't good numbers. Um, they have to be trusted numbers. The college coaches really, really trust us in this. And, yeah. um, 
and I think we have a proven track record. I tell a lot of people, I mean, you've been doing this for a long time. Um, I've been in the park and, you know, speaking to you when coaches have come up and asked for, for some information as far as like when you were releasing reports, things like that. Mm -hmm. So I agree. Are, are there, um, are there numbers that, that stand out to college coaches that, as you said, it's not, it's not everything, right? But obviously, uh, you know, a, an overhand throw or, you know, a home to first time can stand out. Is there any others that tell you a lot as somebody who does this? Or I guess I should ask KJ, but I'm sure you have an idea of what might stand out. Yeah, um, the overhand throw. I mean, Grace Lyons threw at 72 miles an hour as an eighth grader. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she had a big arm. The biggest arm we've ever tested was the Kentucky shortstop who threw at 77. Um, the average D1 player throws at 63. You know, so, yeah. um, you know, we, we have some numbers like that. Um, home to first is a little different because a lot of times it's measured with the slap. And you obviously have a run start. Um, it doesn't really become a 20 yard, 60 foot dash. It's less than that. So we just go with the 20 yard dash and, you know, we know what those numbers are. Can't give away a lot because I'd be giving away our secrets. Sure. Sure. You no, know I mean, but um, because there are things that we know that other people don't know. And it's simply because of the volume of work we've done, you know, over the last 15 years. You know, yeah. with this data. Well, it's kind of like you said that, you know, KJ saw some things that didn't make sense and it stood out to him. It's like anything else. If, if it's what you do and you're immersed in it every day, like you said, and you get information, I don't care, you know, what it is um, or what you're doing. If that's what you do, you know that something's not right. Um, so that's, that's really interesting. So, so, with with having so much experience doing this, I want to ask you something that I was thinking about. You know, with all of the 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 players nowadays and all of the events, and with the opportunity for people to purchase equipment and and do testing, um, you mentioned you know you got to be careful for dirty uh, data. Um, how does how do you feel about other companies, other people getting into the metrics testing and player evaluation space? Oh, baby, Randy. This is why I love Randy, everybody out there who's listening. You know, I, I don't know how far in the weeds we want to go, go with that. But, um, you know, this is America. I mean, people can do what they want. You know, we're big believers in that. Um as a travel ball coach, you know what it's like to have organizations, out-of-state organizations, come and try to poach your players. And, you know, you're having to fight for that all the time. Um, you know, I'm sure kids come to you from other programs. So, you know, there's just a competitive side to the whole business that's just a competitive side. Um, yeah. But that being said, you know, you have Dr. Pepper and you have Dr. Shasta, you know, and let's be serious. There's a difference between those two. Um, yeah. There's just, there's the real deal and there's stuff that's trying to, to follow that. And, um, you know, it is what it is. Uh, I think the one distressing thing, um, is now at this point, we've been doing this for 24 years on deck and we know a lot of people and it's a little disappointing that people, and I'm just bearing my soul here. Um, sure. it's a little disappointing that people who we know wouldn't, you know, wouldn't say, Hey, let's get together and make something great, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but softball kind of has this 
side to it where everybody thinks they can do it or they yeah. can do it better or whatever, which, which is fine, I guess. Um, but, but I think if we collaborate on things in the softball world, I think we're better. And, um, you know, I think we'd, we'd be helping the kids out better if we can collaborate and do the things we're good at and um, leave the other stuff to the, you know, the experts. And that's just me getting on a soapbox. But, um, you know, I wish we'd have a little more collaboration. I yeah. think we'd Has, be better as a sport. So stay in your lane, basically. Yeah. yeah. I'm, um. So has it affected any of your relationships or or, or the relationships of on deck um, softball? Yeah, not from our perspective. No. Um. You know, but there there's a couple people out there who, you know, who get a little territorial. You know, um, yeah. you know, which is unfortunate and, uh, you know, I wish we didn't have that, but, but it is what it is. People are people, um, you know, and we'll always be friends with our friends, you know, yeah. and still consider them friends. There can be dust ups, you know, sure. goodness knows I get irritated with my kids at times and, you know, but they're always going to be my kids and. And my friends are going to always be my friends. And, um, you know, whether you're PGF, Lions, Firecrackers, Bat Busters, um, Impact Gold or Texas Glory, Chill or Bandits, it doesn't matter. I mean, we, we care about the kids. We care about the people involved. Um, and we'll always consider them friends, you know, no matter where we go or what we do. To me, that's what's great about you guys is you're neutral. You're, you're a, you're an observer and you're you're neutral. Um, because I agree, some things get have gotten really tribal, and I think we could all be a little bit better to uh, to try to to help the kids improve. And I, I will <clears> say though, having been in the basketball world, we're way ahead of the basketball world. You know, basketball was that's crazy. Good. It was absolutely nuts. Um, the people in softball are good people. Um, I just think we we could tweak it a little and maybe be a little better to each other, uh, to one another, and, and make it even better. But it's a great sport. It's a great world. Um, and there are good, good people in this sport. It's been good to me and my family. Um, I've Yeah, and I agree. I mean, I think... There's tons of good people, and that that's one of the reasons that one of the things I look forward to the most every summer, every tournament is just seeing people that I know and and kind of you know building on those relationships that softball has brought my way. Yep. So, yep. I'm sure it's the same for you. Yep, absolutely, without question. We love the sport. Hope to stay in it for many years to come. So one of the reasons, you know, obviously that I'm doing this now is that I want to try to elevate the sport and, and see what we can do to bring things together a little bit more um, to try and make it great. I mean, right now I'm focusing on Arizona, but obviously just, you know, um, any message that's a positive message is going to be, you know, universal and hopefully we'll get to lots of different people. But in your opinion, like, is there anything that you wish you could change about the sport? Ooh, okay. We may have just talked um, about that. Yeah, I th there are two things that pop into mind. Um, one, I wish the NCAA would make it a counter sport. I wish we only had full scholarships and that they would increase the number um, to like 18 full scholarships per D1. And this is at the D1 level. Um, per D1 school. Um, if they did th that, I think it would be just better for all involved. I, I can't imagine being a Division One softball coach and having to divvy up monies. You know, yeah. um, you kind of come away like a used car salesman. 
you know, where, whereas in basketball, we just had a certain number of scholarships and you either got a scholarship or you didn't. And so there was no, you know, none of this back and forth. Yeah. I wish they do that. And then the, the other thing is, and I think we have to solve this as a sport. We have to get, to give the time, kids time off. And I realize it's their life and their goal and all of that, but you know, we all know as adults that uh, excessive use of anything or excessive pursuit of something can be detrimental to your mental health and physical health. And I yeah. really wish we could somehow figure out a way to give the kids a break physically and mentally because, you know, we hear from college coaches all the time that they're getting kids who are broken a little bit. You know, mm. that they're broken down a little, um, that they're injured. And um, I wish we could find a, a schedule, a season, a calendar that would really work and would keep, keep, keep the kids playing, but give them time off, you know, to be kids. Yeah. Um, I, I really do. Is that competition or practice or just all of the above? I, I think you just need to get away, you know. Um, Major League Baseball seems like it goes forever, but but I doubt those dudes are working out in December too much. You know, I'm thinking they're putting away the, the glove. I, I think golfers finish up and they put the sticks away for a while. You know, yeah. when do we as a sport really allow our kids to put away their bat and glove? And, um, yeah. You know, and that's a little bit of a concern because we know girls, these young ladies, they'll do what we ask. You know, yeah. um, that's one of the greatest things about working with the young women athletes. Um, but but that can hurt them too. And I wish we were a little more sensitive to that. That's a great point. Huh. Um, how has this sport evolved in, in your mind over the last five years? Oh, man, it's so much better. It's more athletic. It's more dynamic. You know, people might not know this, but softball is the third highest rated sport on ESPN um, behind football and um, men's basketball. Number three is softball. I had a wow. volleyball, women's basketball, baseball, the whole gamut. Number three is softball. And... The sport is blowing up. It's athletic. It's exciting. Um, we went back to the World Series. You know, we went there to watch Stanford play last year. And what a dynamic atmosphere that was. Um, I, I can't wait for the Olympics. I, I think the Olympics in L.A., you know, with Japan coming in, that, that could be the greatest moment in softball history. Japan versus the United States in LA. There's not a stadium in Southern California that can hold the people that would be interested in that. Um, that could be the wow. greatest moment as we, you know, go back and try to pursue getting that gold because we got to win the gold. You know, it, yeah. it's like the dream team situation in basketball where the Russians have beat us a couple of times. I'm dating myself, but then we put together the dream team. Because we said enough is enough. And that's yes. where we are in softball. Enough is enough. Japan is great. They got that one pitcher who's phenomenal. Um, but we, we got to get it done this year in L.A. And that could be the greatest moment in softball history. Yeah, the game has gotten so much coverage. It's expanding um, into leagues into South America. Obviously, like you mentioned, in Japan, um, it's the game is great. I feel like we're just at the beginning of something special and, and I'm really excited to be a part of it. Um, Derek, I know you have to run soon. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to thank you for jumping on. It's been really good to catch up with you. Um, I appreciate your time. Anytime. And, um, yeah, it, it's, it's been really good. Um, so for, I want to thank everybody else for listening as well. Um, I want to, uh, 
let you know that we'll continue to uh, work to elevate the sport and uh, get caught up with those who are influencing the softball community and hopefully help you as a parent or player with your journey. Uh, if you enjoyed this content, please give us a like and a follow on our YouTube channel, Caught Up with Randy K, uh, at Coach K A Z. You can also follow us on X and Instagram using the same handles, at Coach K A Z. Please check out On Deck Softball and ODM Measurements. Um, again, Derek, it's been awesome. I really appreciate it. And let's uh, let's do it again. Yeah, I tell you, for everybody out there, if we know about you, we can help you. If we don't know about you, we can't help you. So if if we can help you in any way, and Randy knows this because he's known us a long time, if we can help you in any way, we want to do that, and that comes from the bottom of our heart. He means that. They go out of their way. I've reached out multiple times and said, hey, I just saw this kid, or we have this kid, uh, and know of this kid, and send me a name, and, and Derek is always working behind the scenes, not just at his events. So, Derek, I, again, I thank you so much for coming on. Thank you very much, Randy. It's always good to see you.